Hey guys, welcome back. Have another interview question for you. What are the four pillars of object-oriented programming? Now the first thing I want you to do is look at this question and focus on the word pillar. Have you ever heard of it before? Now, a pillar is something that is used to provide support for something. So, with that definition, I can actually reword the question what are the four things that provide essential support for object-oriented programming? And that's what I'm going to be talking about in this video. Now, as you can see here, we have an example of what pillars are. As you can see, we have one, two, three, four pillars, and they're all used to provide support to this building here. But when it comes to object-oriented programming, the four pillars are abstraction, encapsulation, polymorphism, and inheritance. In this video, I'm going to be going through and explaining each one of these concepts and showing you how they provide support for object-oriented programming. So let's get right into it. Okay, the first thing I want to talk about is abstraction. So, use your imagination. Imagine that you're in the museum you're walking through and all of a sudden you see this piece of art on the wall. This is what we call abstract art. Now abstract art is art that is open to interpretation. As you can see, this piece of art doesn't have any type of definition to it. There's nothing that is clear cut, it's not concrete, and it's basically a piece of art that only exists as an idea. Or, or another way to explain it, it can only be expressed as an expression. You know, so that's pretty much what abstract art is, and that's pretty much what abstraction is. Abstraction, the concept, basically means to hide the implementation details. So as you can see, this piece of art um, is not concrete. Um, it's open to interpretation, and there's really no definitive I won't say there's no meaning to it because maybe the artist was trying to express something, but it's very hard to decipher immediately what the artist meant by this particular painting when you're looking at it. So that's what abstraction is. Now, on the flip side of that, I want to talk about non-abstract. As you can see here, we have a piece of non-abstract art. As you can see, it's significantly different than abstract art. And the reason it's different from abstract art is because it's presenting the implementation details. We know exactly what's going on here. Um, it's very concrete. And when you first look at this painting, you know what's going on. As you can see clearly in this painting, it looks like a little city. We have people walking through the city. We have buildings. We have trolleys that are running up and down the street. And this, an this is an example of non-abstract art. So a lot of the implementation details are presented to us immediately. And as you can see by the comment that I have down here, non-abstract exists in a real or physical form. It can be immediately interpreted. Also real or solid. And that's pretty much the difference between abstract and non-abstract. Now, let's jump right into the technical details of abstraction. So as I said before, abstraction is something that exists as an idea. It's basically the concept of hiding the implementation details while just presenting the features to the outside world. Another thing is that abstraction is basically information on what the object does instead of how it does it. So when you think about this, especially when you're working with Java, you're thinking of things such as an abstract class or an interface class. So within these two classes, you can these two classes can actually consist of methods that have no implementation. You know, so there's no implementation behind these abstract methods. If you create an abstract method, there's no implementation and pretty much it's 
these are methods that are open for interpretation from another class. Okay, some of the advantages is that it reduces code complexity. And as I said before, you're pretty much just hiding the details and exposing only the essential parts. And if you have any questions about this, uh, make sure you leave them in the comments below. Um, this is pretty straightforward, but um, if I'm going to explain a little bit more in the next slide now. Okay, so what I have here is an example of abstraction. So, as you can see at the top of the page, we have this interface called Actor. Now, as we know, actors, when they're performing, they can go through many different emotions. So I just have some abstract methods here in this interface class Actor. Methods are act happy, act sad, act angry, and act like you're in love. So, as you can see, we're incorporating abstraction in this interface. As you can see, there's no implementation details. There's only features that are presented, but there are no implementation details, just like that piece of abstract art that I showed you earlier. Now, as you can see, right below this interface, there are two classes, class called Ben and a class called Sue. We're just going to imagine that Ben and Sue both are both actors, you know? or they want to be actors, okay? Now, when Ben is acting happily, he may act happily different than how Sue acts when she's happy. You know, she may react a different way when she's happy. That goes the same also for the rest of the methods. Act sad, act angry, and act like you're in love. And just like a piece of abstract art, it's open to interpretation. So a piece of abstract art, just like I was talking about before, it's open to interpretation, different perspectives from different people. They can see abstract art in different ways, and they can inspire them in different ways. And just like this class that we have here, class man and class suit, you know, um, the way, the reason you know of why Ben and Sue you know may act differently is pretty much going to be based on a lot of things. You know, maybe their experience in life. You know. Um, the parents they grew up with and you know everything like that just comes together and they're basically implementing their own version of acting happy or acting sad or acting angry so just wanted to um, you know go over that so that you guys have a clear understanding of exactly what's going on when it comes to abstraction but essentially abstraction um, is this interface here and I just wanted to relate this to the piece of abstract art I showed you earlier and hopefully this allows you to have a better understanding of what abstraction is in the technical sense okay now what I wanted to do is just emphasize um, abstraction and no abstraction a little bit more and I just wanted to use it and, and I just want to explain it with these pictures that I have here. So um, what I have here is an astronaut class, okay? And this astronaut class, um, it is an abstract class. So as we know, when we're working with abstract classes, an abstract class can consist of abstract methods and non-abstract methods. But in this particular class, we're working with non-abstract methods. So in this astronaut class, we have properties and we have some non-abstract methods properties such as full name, address, age, and then we have some non-abstract methods that are methods that um, individuals would use in order to become an astronaut. And I have some methods here that do allow implementation. So these methods are already implemented. Um, go to school, do well in math and science, major in astronomy, get an astronaut job. So as you can see, these methods you know, are pretty vague. Um, but what I was actually trying to do is um, actually explain no abstraction. So basically, each of these individuals, Arthur, Buster, and Francine, they can inherit all of the methods and properties of, well, pretty much, yeah, they can inherit all the methods of this class and become an astronaut. Let's just say they all have a dream of one day becoming an astronaut. So basically what's happening is that 
we're um, presenting, you know, the implementation details. So the implementation details are pretty similar to the non-abstract piece of artwork I showed you earlier. Since all this stuff is presented, everyone is able to quickly understand what they need to do in order to become an astronaut. So um, hopefully, hopefully that makes sense. If it doesn't, you know, just leave me some comments below. But I'm just trying to make this as easy as possible for you guys to understand. But this is an example of no abstraction. And what I have here is just a quick little example of abstraction. And the first thing I want you to do is just imagine that we have this class called Dream. And Dream is an interface. And as we all know, when you're working with interfaces, the interface can only consist of implicit abstract methods. And these methods that we have down here do not have any implementation. There are people or individuals who have to implement these methods themselves. So if you have a dream, these are some of the methods or some of the things that you need to do in order to achieve your dream, which you're going to incorporate yourself. What you can, what's your passion, do hard work, believe in yourself, never give up, and learn as much as you can. And, you know, after, you know, a lot of hard work and, you know, executing each one of these methods, you will eventually achieve your dream, you know, because your dream is open to interpretation, just like in a piece of abstract art. And that's pretty much it. All right, let's move on to the next pillar. All right. The next thing I want to talk about is encapsulation. Encapsulation is basically when you restrict access to some of an object's components. So what that means is that if you wanted to create a class that is abstract, first of all, the class have to have has to have private data members and the data members can only be accessed through public getter and setter methods. It's pretty much what encapsulation is. Um, some of the advantages is are that the um, data members are private, so that means that um, components of the class cannot be randomly accessed. Another thing is that data members are only accessed through the getter and setter methods. And that's pretty much it. And this is an example here of encapsulation. As you can see, we have ourselves a student class. The student class consists of private data members which are name, major, and age. And the only way these data members can be modified are through public getter and setter methods, just like you see here. It's pretty straightforward. Okay, polymorphism. What is polymorphism? Polymorphism is are objects that have more than one form. Um, it's also a class that has the same behavior and shares the same functionality of its parent. And to explain this a little bit more clear, take a look at this picture. Right here, we have a tiger. This is not only a tiger. A tiger can be multiple things. A, a tiger can be a mammal. Tiger can also be a carnivore. A tiger can be a tiger, and a tiger, in a technological sense, can also be an object. So what I'm going to do on this next slide is actually break down the concept of polymorphism. Okay. So as you can see here, on this slide, we have public interface carnivore, public class animal, and public class tiger extends animal and implements carnivore. So what's happening here, as you can see, this tiger is going to be polymorphic. Okay, this tiger is polymorphic is because the tiger object has more than one form. As you can see, this tiger class here is going to extend animal and is going to implement carnivore.
which are the two forms that are associated with tiger. And when you're dealing with polymorphism, the number one thing that you need to do is use the ISA, the um, ISA um, concept. So basically, if you have an object, you want to go, a tiger is a animal, a tiger is a carnivore, a tiger is a tiger, and a tiger is an object. And basically, this is what's happening right here. So we have our object tiger, and then we have tiger T equals new tiger. Then we have animal A equals new T. Okay, and carnivore C equals T, and then object O equals T. So as you can see, T, or tiger here, has more than one form. Since we have, since the first thing we did, we created an instance of tiger, and then we just assigned the T to animal, we assigned the T to carnivore, and we also assigned the T to object, which basically means that this object has more than one form. And this is the concept of polymorphism. Now, the last thing I want to talk about is inheritance. Now, this is pretty straightforward. I think every developer out there needs to know exactly what inheritance is already. But it's basically the concept of creating or modifying a new class from an existing class. So I know you guys have heard of parent classes and child classes. And basically, if you have a child class, that child class is going to inherit from the parent class. And then that child class will be able to use um, properties or methods from that parent class. You know, I felt like this pillar really didn't need too much explanation because it's a fairly simple concept. But if you guys do have any questions, make sure to please leave them in the comments below and let me know what you need help understanding. And this pretty much brings us to the end of the video. You know, I just wanted to go over the four pillars of software development or um, object-oriented programming because it's something that you definitely need to know if you are a developer. If you have any questions, leave them in the comments below. Don't forget to like the video if you've learned something from here. Also, don't forget to subscribe. And see you in the next one.